Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today, I want to talk to you about a little bit of local history for me. And, well, it's linked to the US space program of the 1960s and 1970s. So, I occasionally go kayaking out of a place in Sausalito. And in that area, there's a building that's currently being destroyed. And on the side, it says Machine Shop. It was, well, the machine shop for the Marin Shipbuilding Dis uh, Division of W.A. Bechtel Company, generally shortened to Marin Ship. And during World War II, this shipyard was stood up in a matter of months uh, so that it could build ships for the war effort. In the few years that it operated, it built almost 100 tankers and freighters and supply ships. Now, after the war, most of these ships would be retired or put placed in reserve fleets. But in the 1960s, three of these would be brought out of storage and rebuilt as tracking ships for the Apollo program. And these would become the USNS Redstone, Vanguard and Mercury. But they weren't the first ships the US built to track rockets. So the US has operated tracking ships for rockets since uh, like 1950. This was the bumper test of the V2 where there were suborbital launches. And they flew these over the Atlantic. So to track them, they borrowed a pair of destroyers and they pretty much used their uh, like fire control radar and optical systems to track the hardware. But the first time the uh, dedicated set of tracking ships were stood up was for the development of the Snark cruise missile. So this was a cruise missile that would have a range of about 5,500 miles. And in the testing, it would carry it over thousands of miles of the Atlantic Ocean before it reached the final target tracking station. Now, if anything went wrong in that thousands of miles of empty no ocean, they would have had a very hard time to figure out what really went on there. So to fill this literal gap, they got six ships from the ready reserve fleet, ships which had been built for use in World War II, and then they modified them to be tracking ships. So these were like small freight supply ships. They were 54 meters long and about 550 tons. The army had built hundreds of these as small ships to supply troops in the field. They weren't even given names, they were just given numbers. So when the Air Force took control, they were given simple call signs from the phonetic alphabet, echo through kilo. And they give them the antennas and the other tracking equipment for their mission. Uh, and they would spend weeks at sea to collect like 15 minutes worth of telemetry as the missiles flew past them. So anyway, after that, the next batch of tracking ships that were developed by the US uh, were for the bigger rockets that would actually go into space. Things like the Thor, the Atlas and the Titan. So this group of ships were converted from the larger C-1 cargo ships. And they were about like, they were twice as long, like 120 meters, 4,000 tons. And two of these would actually end up ultimately after you sort of evolution, being assigned to Project Mercury specifically. This would be the USNS Rose Knot and the Coastal Sentry. And they would get extra equipment to allow them to actually send commands to the spacecraft. They wouldn't be passive observers. So like previous satellite experiments hadn't really needed continuous communications, but for Project Mercury, NASA's medical experts, they wanted the flight surgeons to have continuous availability throughout the orbit. So they came up with a network of tracking stations around the world, and you know, mostly in friendly, friendly countries and territories. Bermuda, the Canary Islands, Nigeria, Zanzibar, Australia, Mexico. But in the oceans, they had to fill those gaps, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Ocean. So they put ships to cover this. Now, these ships were expected to actually operate independently from mission control, right? The stations on land could send signals via landlines to mission control and get feedback, but the ships out at sea couldn't guarantee that they would be able to contact shore. They might be able to get radio messages through, but they certainly couldn't send the real-time telemetry. So every ship would have a small team dedicated to them with like Capcom and flight surgeons. Now, John Glenn was actually the Capcom on the coastal sentry for the final flight of the Mercury program supporting Gordon Cooper on a mission which would last 34 hours. Now, because of that duration being so long, not every tracking site would be able to communicate for every single orbit. And when the flight started having technical problems on the, 13, uh, on the 19th orbit, the only ground stations in a position to communicate with him were Hawaii 
and Zanzibar. The coastal sentry was in the correct place in anticipation of re-entry. But because of the technical issues, they needed to come up with a new re-entry checklist and Glenn had to communicate that. And then one hour later, as Gordon Cooper was trying to manually fly the re-entry, John Glenn gave him the countdown and the mark to activate the retro thruster. Okay, so flash forward a few years and it's the Gemini program. And again, the Rose Knot and the Coastal Sentry are operating. They've been upgraded a little, but they're still very much autonomous uh, mission control systems. Now, during the drama of Gemini 8, they were both in a position to communicate with the capsule during those orbits when the stuck thruster caused the spacecraft to enter a rapid uncommanded roll. They worked with the crew on the last few orbits as emergency situation forced the mission to be cut short and new re-entry plans had to be made and communicated to the crew. So anyway, that's uh, the first group. There's another group of tracking ships that were converted and these were made from the larger VC-2 or Victory class ships. So these are larger still than the C-1 hulls that the, um, the Rose Knot is. So there's like nine of these, I think. They were acquired various times by various programs, but I think most of them ended up supporting the Pacific Missile Range, and in particular the Corona program, where you have rockets going up and capsules coming back down. But a couple of these ended up being used to support NASA's Human Spaceflight Program. Uh, so actually, yeah, the range tracker was also used in Germany. Uh, but the Watertown and the Huntsville, those were actually upgraded to work as Apollo tracking ships. With uh, They were used for the re-entry and recovery in the Pacific. So now that brings me to the three ships practically built in my backyard. These are larger still. They're based on T2 tankers. Now these tankers were 160 meters long and they would displace over 2,000 tons when full of oil. There were about 500 of these built to supply US fleets during World War II. I mean, to get an idea of how fast these were built, there's one example in Marin that was built in 33 days from keel laying to sea trials. So the specific type that was used for conversion was the T2SEA2, which were exclusively built by the Marin shipyards. These were distinguished over the others by having improved engines, which delivered something like 30 to 5 to 40 percent more power than the more common versions. Now, many of these ones were named for the fortified missions, which were established in California by order of the King of Spain in the 18th and 19th century. The mission San Juan would become the Mercury, the mission De Pala became the Redstone, and the mission San Fernando became the Vanguard. And of course, since you're all space fans, you can see the theme behind those names, right? The modified ships would be 21 meters longer at a total of 181 meters, but they didn't simply cut them in half and add an extra chunk of hull in the middle. They actually cut out the entire midsection of the ship, which was mostly fuel tanks. They took only the bow and the stern and then built an entirely new midsection. The modified vessels, uh, they included like a whole bunch of large steerable dish antennas above the deck. They, they supported sending and receiving and radar. They had a suite of electronics below deck, including like computers, right? They had all the equipment necessary to send commands to the vehicles and decode the telemetry. Like the ships that supported Mercury in Germany, they had been built with the notion that they could operate as standalone mission control stations independent of the primary mission control in Houston. However, in the intervening years, satellite technology had developed quite quickly and by the time these were operating, the ships actually had pretty reliable satellite uplinks, which provided like bi-directional relay between the ship systems and mission control in Houston. So the onboard autonomy that they had been built with was never really needed when they were actually operating in the Apollo program. But you know, to be clear, these weren't just dumb satellite relays. One interesting and important system that set them apart from the land-based tracking stations was the Ship's Position and Measuring System, or SPAMS, which in many ways resembled the inertial navigation hardware used on spacecraft, and it could be used to determine the ship's position to within you know, about 100 meters, and that in turn allowed them to determine 
the spacecraft's position to a similar uh, precision. So they would have one tracking ship that would be positioned so that it could track the completion of the translunar injection burn, and then that would be able to instantly provide independent measurements of the injection trajectory to make sure that the vessel was in fact on the correct course for the moon, and you know figure out what kind of course corrections would be needed to get there according to plan. And for Apollo 11, this job was given to the Mercury. But all of this, it really just served to confirm the reliability of the onboard systems. And after the success of Apollo 11, most of the ships stopped being used. The Redstone, the Mercury, and the Huntsville weren't used for future launches after Apollo 11, and they were all returned to the reserve for other uses. Only the Vanguard remained as the Atlantic tracking station needed for immediate post-launch support. And it performed the job for all the launches in, of the Saturn rockets, all the way through Apollo, Skylab, and of course Apollo Soyuz. Technology had basically made the dedicated tracking ships largely redundant. Like improved onboard systems on the rockets meant that they are the spacecraft meant that they needed less ground control. And as the equipment itself got smaller, there was less need to devote an entire ship to it. And of course, US spacecraft in orbit began to use communication satellites, which means that they didn't have to worry about ground station visibility all the time. So eventually all the tracking ships involved in Mercury, Gemini and Apollo have been scrapped. I mean, some have had limited careers after this, uh, you know, in, after their role in the space race. Um, Vanguard actually worked on the development of submarine navigation systems in the 1980s and it was still doing stuff in 1998 when it was retired and in 2013 it eventually made its last voyage to Brownsville, Texas to be scrapped just down the road from where SpaceX has been making lots of more scrap metal. There is one tracking vessel that's still pretty recognisable but it wasn't involved in any of the human spaceflight missions the Vandenberg was built as a troop carrier in Richmond, California, again, pretty close to me. And in the 1960s, it was converted to track missile tests, specifically measuring the re-entry dynamics of warheads. And in the late 1990s, it was actually used for the movie Virus. It was redecorated to look like a Russian research ship. But finally, in 2009, it was intentionally sunk near Key West to form an artificial reef. It would become a tourist attraction for sports divers to explore and, of course, for marine life to call home. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.